We're great. We're fine. We're lovely. We speak for each other. We, us, you, me, hi, hello. <laughs> me, hi, hello. <laughs> this is Two Girls, One Ghost. Two Girls, One Ghost. And uh, we are your ghostesses. That's Corinne. Hi. And I'm Sabrina. And you and I were just giggling to ourselves today because when we we did episode 227 seven in uh, a couple encounters with each other in person, and we were just laughing at how funny we are when we're together. It's just so much easier to talk when there's not a delay over technology, right? Like we're like, boom, 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 boom. It's just, it'll be nice when we're together again. We also, I think, are physical comedians. Like we're a bit Charlie Chaplin. Oh, you think? Yeah, we're like a bit banana peel. Like, yeah, we're hilarious. We were also just recording for so many hours straight that we got a little loony. We didn't have enough coffee. Mm -hmm. We had multiple breaks in between to let Rolly out to go explore the backyard. Like there was just, it was kind of chaos. (laughs) But that's the best kind. It's just fun chaos. I love that you have the two girls, one ghost. Do you always use that water bottle? I have mine. It's actually Mm -hmm. in this hutch right here. But someone sent it to our PO box. It's wonderful. It's a Bigfoot getting beamed up by a UFO. Oh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can get a a little looksy-loo. Get a little looksy Lou. And I love all the gifts that we get. <laughs> so send us more. <laughs> <laughs> I have a bunch of them behind me. I have the Poen, what's it called? Um, the Rules of Living. Poen Co Embroidery of- Rules of Living. Mm-hmm. I have some aliens. Show and tell. I got a plushie and a, the hand knitted ones. Yeah, just uh, trying to live amongst the spiritual the spirits the spirits and the gifts given to all of you what if we started collecting haunted objects i mean we do have our heroes that that do that craig and dana newkirk Mm -hmm. i'm not as against it as i used to be remember when someone went to the bell witch cave And then attended our show in Nashville and gave us a flower from the Bell Witch Cave. And we were so nervous at that point in time about being cursed because there were so many things that just had already happened to us. And I don't think we were as prepared. Not that I'm saying we're prepared now, but I just feel like (laughs) mentally we've we've heard more (laughs) stories. So I feel like I'm almost a little bit more. I won't be surprised when things happen as much as I would be before. But we were so nervous. We sent it back to the to the Bell Witch Cave. But now I'm kind of like... I don't think I would. I do wonder, though, if like logistically, because we didn't take it, we ourselves did not remove the item. If it being gifted to us would pass along the cursing or if we, I don't know. And then also if if people sent us their haunted items and I'm not saying do that because we have not agreed to it yet. Suddenly we're collectors. I'm just just pontificating, getting the idea out there, getting responses, seeing what you think. Anyway, if people sent them to us. Yet again, another business idea. (laughs) Suddenly our trinkets are haunted. This one though, we have very little control. I've put it out here and now other people have to, will have to make the thing happen. Here's the thing. I don't want to encourage people too hard because after we talked to Em and Christine and heard about the weird things they get sent in their mail, I'm nervous to open the door because then what if people are like, well, here's a bucket of teeth that I think are haunted. And I'm like, well, I don't want that bucket of teeth. I think we should set up a PO box in LA next to you. I would love that (laughs) because I was just going to say, I'm really okay with weird things. Like, I think I was born to take people's weird things. And I think Leia agrees. (laughs) I feel like we're watching so many versions of you over the past like (laughs) month. I'm just like, I have no idea what to expect every time we come to the recording. (laughs) Now you're born to take people's haunted (laughs) objects. I'm like, what? Where did this come from? I was born to be abducted by aliens. I was born to be... Okay, here's the thing. I'm, you know, I am giving to myself. It's a lot of self-exploration, a lot of self-love, a lot of healing my inner child and loving my inner child. And so I'm in a discovery phase. I didn't really get to have it growing up. Yeah. New themes being introduced every week. 
It's great. Yes. So today, where I am at this very current moment, give me your teeth. <laughs> Chop off your nails. No. I'll take them. Oh, God. Dead skin. I don't want that, but you can send it to us. <laughs> Here's the thing. You already get dead skin all the time in the form of dust. It just exists in the air. You just got some dead skin on your tongue as you just... I'm breathing it in right now. So dead skin, you know, we've got plenty. But if you want to take a little <laughs> razor and you want to shave a little canine off and give a piece of your fang to Sabrina, she'll take it. See, this is the thing. I begin with a new exploration and I start to dabble. I dip my toes in and I'm like, hmm, what's this about? And then you go, take a razor and shave off your teeth. How is that any different than what you already just said? What? Why? Because I'm supporting you now. I'm like, yes, to your inner child. Here's some other ideas. It was the same idea. I just repeated it. Yes, but you repeated it in a much more like, oh, I've thought about this for years kind of way. I was just trying to find a middle ground for people giving you what you want, which is their teeth, and them getting to keep their teeth in their mouths. Well, they don't have to pull out their adult teeth. Compromise. I will also take fillings. That's creepier. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Corinne, you're making me sound like a crazy woman. You're the you're the wicked witch in the cabin in the woods. <laughs> Did I ever tell you that so I should have known back then, but I was cast once as a role that had very little lines, aka no lines, but her name was Lafina and she laughed and she had a hilarious laugh. And that was all that I did the entire show. Just laugh across the stage? Lafina. Yeah, and I'd have, let's see. <clears throat> let's see if I can <clears throat> muster plug that. your ears or lower the volume for a moment. Okay. <clears throat> Where did that come from? The depths of your belly. Like that was so. It's from Lafina. I've never, I'm me. sweating. I've never heard anything <laughs> like that come from you ever before. Wow. Because I've never laughed ever before. Because <laughs> you don't laugh. Um, okay. So you think of this role as being this role that was given to you because it didn't have a speaking role. But after hearing that laugh, I really think that you. If you auditioned with laughing, 100%. And it was also just so unexpected, which <laughs> is something that I think probably in theater is a good thing. So I think you actually got that role because you were the best at that role. Thank you so you much. You won first place. Um, I stole the show. Yes. Yeah, you did. You stole this show right now, this laugh. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. This Thank you. Great the time. end. The end. <laughs> Submit your creepiest laugh along with your And send us your teeth. teeth. <laughs> what else no. what else could we collect okay what's a little less creepy but still you know um treats my soul like some ice cream maybe just a rock from every haunted place that someone has been a nearby rock i feel like that's that's something that i would accept because it's like oh this probably isn't haunted it's just more of like you know when people collect sand from the beaches of the places they go on vacation but i, I realize that that's not nearly as extreme as what you're looking for. No, I want something a little bit weirder. Okay, you know what? This is a total pivot, but I just got excited about this idea. So you and I, when we were together, we started doing this, <laughs> this silly game that we were really bad at, where we told a ghost story back and forth between the two of us. You Can were good we at do it. it? I was bad at it. Can we do it right now? Can we just do one? <sighs> okay, but you make fun of me every time we do it, and then you're like, what's wrong I won't with you? I promise, I promise I won't make fun of you. And if I do, if I, if I start to laugh at you, I will go, I will turn my back and be in timeout for a minute. And if you do that, I will <laughs> never give you one of the prized possessions that I think could be a haunted artifact in your collection. And that is the earwax ball that my brother created over multiple years in our haunted home. So I don't know what, I don't know why, but the fact that if I, I feel like I can't know you personally if you're giving me an earwax ball. Okay. You don't want a piece of me? Fine. <laughs> I get it. I think I'd rather a tooth of yours. <laughs> and I'm going to wear it around a what necklace. What else would you like? 
teeth are out choose another thing my earlobe i don't know i'll just cut it off for you little van gogh moment. oh my gosh i want to do like the harry potter thing where i cut off a piece of your hair while you're sleeping even though that's not part that part's not in harry potter and then put it in like, a little like what harry potter is this in put it in a little glass vial and wear it around my neck that way you're always with me thanks <laughs> see we don't even have to play the game i just wrote a scary story right away great okay, but let's play Oh, Before no. we get into Shoot. the story, because I, I have a I really thought I would talk enough story. and then you would forget that we were doing the prompt. No, no, no. Nice try. <laughs> okay. It didn't work. Uh, that wasn't the Lafina uh, laugh. Okay, I'm going to begin. Okay. There were two little girls, and they got lost in the woods. Night began to fall. And as night fell, they heard a strange noise from the depths of the darkness. It sounded a little bit like a laugh. <laughs> they looked at each other, scared. Did you hear that? I did. Okay. So they start looking, looking around. <laughs> <laughs> I like how there's acting as part of this now. I know. I didn't realize that that was part of it. Okay. <laughs> It all falls quiet again. They hear the croak of a frog, the crunch of the leaves, and then they hear, My pretties. They spin on their heels. They spin on their heels. They click them three times. <laughs> There's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like, <gasps> and all of a sudden they drop dead. The end. <laughs> <laughs> Sleep well, children. Good night. <laughs> You're going to be the mom at sleepovers where it's like, Mom, can you tell us a scary story to end our sleepover? And none of the children are ever able to return and sleep over at your house because the story you tell them is so terrifying. It keeps all of them up. I can't wait to make up my own ghost stories and spooky stories at night. Until then, we have a ghost story that we did not write. Well, that I researched. Well, you wrote part of it, oh, yeah. but it's it's factual. Well, I, you pieced I wrote it all together in, yes, in the form correct. of a podcast episode. Yes. So to begin this story, I have a personal story. And I've talked about this a bit. But a couple weeks ago, I was in New York and I was sitting inside the haunted Chelsea Hotel in New York City. And it's a place filled of history and a lot of hauntings that both guests, workers, and the internet fully acknowledge and like you know i was there asking everyone about it i talked about it briefly in an episode that comes out this week before this one i don't know somewhere find it sometime in the past month it's been discussed and i was introduced to the hotel colorado while i was sitting there um i was looking up other haunted hotels and hotel colorado came up on the interwebs And I was so excited because it was another hotel that seemingly also acknowledged their hauntings. Their website is covered with history and hauntings. There's like countless stories on their website. I love that. I love that they admit to it and that they lean in and that they're like, hell yes, we're haunted because it doesn't stop other people from visiting. And other hotels need to understand that half the people that are coming, if not 98 percent, never even know that it's haunted. They're still booking a room. So there's no harm in just saying, yes, we've heard there are ghosts and there's numerous experiences that we've all had and people who've stayed here for those of us who want to hear it. Okay, Hotel Roosevelt. This is my exact, you, you've you basically just read my mind, Corinne, because I was so excited. I love, I love, love, love when people places, things, they lean in. Like, I love when they lean into their spooky ass shit. They're just like, yep, hey, here I am. It's like you, it's like you and I, we are weird. I want teeth, we're spooky, we're leaning in. It's fine. Just admit it to yourself and just roll with the punches and then you're bound for a good time. There's no harm done. Yes. Just say yes. It's a yes and life. Yes and. And it's also like, if you're haunted, how cool you get to go to a cocktail party and you don't have to like like awkwardly like what do i talk about you just lean in and be like hey guess what i'm haunted can you imagine the orientation those employees must experience when they get hired there there has to be a paranormal piece right (sighs) 
Well, Corinne, this story takes a turn. Oh, okay. My personal story. So here I am. I'm in the Haunted Chelsea Hotel, finding about the Haunted Hotel Colorado. I add it to the list of places I want to research. And then this past Friday, Friday, June 23rd, I guess this will be two Fridays ago after this episode comes out, I began my deep dive. I read article after article, all of which I'm going to share in just a minute. But first, I need to say, Corinne, I believe there's a massive cover-up at play here. Oh, okay. And I am concerned for the future of hauntings. (laughs) Good thing the GBI exists. Because this is exactly... And GBI is being enacted right now. This is why we created it. First case ever. Correct. Hotel Colorado. Yes. Okay. So picture this. It's June 23rd, 2023. It's an overcast day in LA. My feet, which um, if anyone are interested, will be available for the world to see if you if you would like to pay a fee. You gotta but you gotta start putting your your money where your mouth is, Sabrina. Corinne, I recently just was awarded a superlative most likely to sell something on only phantoms. Or on OnlyFans, that isn't nudity. <laughs> only and, fans. On our and, Patreon. And then it's happening. Okay. Anyway, I, I've been working on it. So my feet, they're propped up on the coffee table. And I'm just like, you know, sinking into the couch. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder if the Hotel Colorado has any haunting records from guests. Similar to the Chelsea Hotel. When I went to the front desk, they printed out this whole sheet for me. So I was like, oh my gosh, Sabrina, that's such a good question. Why don't you call and find out? So I did. I dialed 970-945-6511. Ring, ring, ring. Please hold, Corinne, because I have something to play to you. You recorded them? Well, I'm not going to play the voice because... Oh, but I'm I was gonna... like, I don't think that's legal. <laughs> okay, ready? But I'm very impressed with you. I did. Manager, dial one three nine. For human resources, dial one zero nine. You will be transferred to. And I will not play her voice. For a minute, I thought they were going to say like for ghostly inquiries, dial six six six. Corinne. Yes. The woman I spoke with, and I'll send you this audio file so you can listen to it yourself. But I did transcribe it. I okay. pressed zero for the front desk, as the menu requested I do. And I asked, ever so genuinely and ever so kindly with my prettiest smile that she couldn't see. I said, hi, my name's Sabrina. And I was just doing research on the Hotel Colorado, and I saw that you have quite the haunted history. Do you happen to keep record of hauntings experienced by the guests? And my goodness, this is where the cover-up begins, Corinne. I got connected with the worst, the wrongest person. She was very lovely. She was doing her job, but she informed me. She said, we are not haunted. That's a myth. One that the owners are not advertising and no longer hosting ghost tours or handing out literature on. I said, oh, I'm really curious then. Like there's, you know, the website has a lot of hauntings listed on it. She said, she knows, but the, the owners are trying to move away from it. So I was like, I respect, uh, mad respect, business focused response. I get it. Okay. But I was like, you know what? I'm just going to try one more time because she's, she's being polite. So I'm like, I don't know if she's just like, you know, based on what she's been told, like, Hey, don't talk about the hauntings or, you know, I don't know if she's following rules. So I say, all right, I know the hotel is moving away from it and I totally understand, but between you and I, have you had any experiences? And I swear this woman, we were on the phone, but through the phone, she looked me deep in my soul with hatred and said, I don't believe in any of that. I mean, your head can create anything that it wants. Okay. How quickly she has fallen from our good graces and how confident I am that something scary happened to her on that property. (laughs) Because that's a really aggressive... It just feels like there's a lot of emotion and energy behind those words. And so it makes me assume that she had some sort of negative experience, whether it be with a guest who was looking for the hauntings or a spirit themselves. But or she just adamantly doesn't believe, you know, there are people who just are like whether whatever they believe in, like spiritually or religiously or 
universally, they very much could believe that ghosts are not real, that we are, that there is no evidence, therefore it is not real. And you know what? To each their own, you and I know differently. And this is why I believe there is a cover up. Something suspicious is afoot. Um, because yeah, she very much did not believe in the paranormal. She said that she had been working there for three months and in that time had not experienced anything, which three months in the grand scheme of things is not very much. No, it's not. Although it's strange that there's so much training happening to say, like, we're no longer pushing out literature. We're no longer pushing out the narrative that this place is haunted. Yet they didn't do the first step, which is remove the information from their own website. Oh, I agree. Corinne, I literally, after that phone call, I screenshotted everything from the website because I was so nervous that this woman was going to go to the owner and be like, we need to take it down now. And that I was going to look back and it would be gone. But it's still there. Don't worry. Do you think maybe it's not about the owners at all, but someone, a new manager has come in and has a hatred. They're the anti-ghost head. They're the head of anti-ghost propaganda. And now they're like, I'm going against the owners. I'm going against the website. We're infiltrating it from the inside. Ghosts aren't real. <sighs> you know, I don't, I don't know. And, um, I don't think we'll have an answer, but it's upsetting, but I'm also so glad that you called. I feel like that's a really brave thing to do. I can't say I would do the same, but I'm glad that you were <laughs> confident enough to call and just ask. That's impressive. Thank you. Yes, I did think it was important for me to just do some extensive research and look in a way that, you know, we have previously, but um, see what happens. So that's what I did. And unfortunately, my results were uh, upsetting to say the least, but... <laughs> Uh, you know what? Despite her reluctance to share anything, I decided that I will enact GBI forces um, or call upon them, which is us, and uncover the truth. So this information is public. And most importantly, like we said, it is on their website. So I don't understand why they deny it. It is a this is a class TGOG red flag ghost atrocity level cover up. So here we are. We are going to uncover the ghost, the haunts, the history, and ultimately the truth. We begin our story. Thank you, Corinne. I appreciate your support. You're welcome. I feel like I'm at the most intense, most marvelous TED Talk I've ever been to. Well, you're gonna, it's going to get better because I have some f sound effects to play with, with this story. Wow. You went all in. Our, this is highly produced now. We open our story on a dusty road amidst the Rocky Mountains and blue skies. The sound of footsteps, crunch, crunch. A black-heeled cowboy boot steps into frame. An ominous whistle strikes the ear as wind picks up stray pieces of straw. A spur strikes the ground and a horse neighs. The plucking of a guitar, and we find ourselves in the wild, wild west. Ding, 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 ding. Yes. So, we're in the wild, wild west. Cowboys, gold miners, horses and hearses, apparently from my brain to my mouth. Train cars, drinkers, thieves and outlaws. An unruly scraggle of men seeking adventure, exploration, and fortune. Again. Bandits and outlaws prowl the small western mining towns. Gunslingers spitting in metal buckets bet their money on high stakes, life and death games. Laws were meant to be broken, and so they were broken. <laughs> Incredible. As two gunslinging intoxicated men drew their weapons for a standoff in a small Glenwood Springs saloon, the double doors blew open. The men in the saloon turned their heads and saw a man whose presence was so palpable that he sucked out all sound. His name was Walter Devereaux, and he was sick and tired and tired and sick of the rough and tumble of the town. He saw the beauty in Glenwood Springs, Colorado, and had a hunger for modern civilization, and he had the money for it. Inspired by the 16th century Medici Palace, Devereaux hired an architect to replicate it in Colorado. He paid $850,000 in 1891, which today is about $33 million. 
dollars. Where'd he get all that money? Gold, baby. Dang. And he, with that money, hired an architect to begin the construction of a hotel and furthermore the construction of a more civilized society. Three years later, construction was complete and the Hotel Colorado, which was then called the Defiance, which I love because it was like Devereaux was defying the defying of the Wild West. Mm. And here it was finally set to open. It was built with Roman brickwork and heavy sandstone. The rooms were built with private baths and fireplace, beautiful decor. There was a 25 foot waterfall inside the lobby. There was a beautiful pool and out front, there was a replica of a fountain that was at the World Fair. Ooh! It was exported in all the way from Italy and shot up several hundred feet in the air. So cool. Ugh. I wonder where this thing is now. I hope it wasn't destroyed. It's still there. It's still there? Yeah. Let's go. So it's stunning. And it's certainly, as you as you uh, have heard with the music and my uh, beautiful scene setting that I did. Thank you. Pat on my back. This area at the time didn't really match the stunning beauty of this hotel. And the clientele of the locals didn't really match the clientele or even just like the aura of the Hotel Colorado, which is actually Devereaux's purpose. That was his point because this hotel was not for the locals. In fact, the locals were not allowed to come. It was meant for more civilized society, a more sophisticated type. We're talking presidents. So on opening weekend, he hosted a massive party. There were fireworks. He had brought like socialites from all over the world there. I would say all over the US specifically. And the hotel became super successful. It was frequented by Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and the unsinkable Molly Brown, uh, and many other notable names. The hotel began to transform the Glenwood Springs, Colorado region. And then, interestingly, while built to defy defiance, the hotel itself was used to be defiant during the Prohibition era. In the 1920s, infamous outlaw Diamond Jack Altry, which I think is just like the most perfect outlaw name, Diamond. Diamond Jack, pleased to meet you. But he went for gold? So he actually set up shop at the Hotel Colorado during Prohibition mm. and was like the local kingpin and used the hotel as headquarters, turning several of the rooms into speakeasies, bars, and rum running spaces. And I guess he worked with Al Capone. This is making me wonder more about Theodore Roosevelt's daughter's life because she was kind of a wild child. And I wonder if she ever spent time here and kind of like ran she with did. all these men. She did? Oh my gosh. I was literally reading a quote from him the other day that I'm going to paraphrase it, but he said something like, I can either run the country or tend to my daughter, but I can't do both. Because that is was... so funny. <laughs> well... I have a story about Alice in just, in just a minute. Okay, amazing. But they spent a lot of their time there. I think it was like in the early 1900s, so before Prohibition, as as far as I understand. Maybe a little bit of a crossover with these people, but probably not as much as... I think she was younger Got uh, it. during okay. Hotel Colorado days. So it is used for rum running, and there's a lot of illicit illegal activity occurring in the Hotel Colorado Prohibition eventually ended, but then World War II began, and in 1943, the U.S. Navy took over the Hotel Colorado, using it as a medical facility called the U.S. Naval Convalescent Hospital. They cared for nearly 6,500 patients during three years of operation, and when the Navy took over it, they changed a lot of the hotel because obviously they're not using it as a hotel anymore, they're using it as a Hospitals, so they converted a lot of the rooms into hospital rooms. They closed up a lot of the fireplaces, if not all of them. They removed a lot of the really nice materials and decor. And they built a naval prison with eight cells down in the basement. They also installed, and this is so interesting, they also installed a naval grade fire system, as in which is very apropos. They really brought the water because apparently, even today, that's still that fire system. It's so intense that after it was the Naval Hospital and it reopened as a hotel, the staff would put cards in the guest room that stated, 
We have a fire system installed by the U.S. Navy that pumps out, and I, I don't know what the number is specifically, but X number of gallons per minute. So in case of a fire, you are more likely to drown than burn. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Can you imagine? Whoa. <laughs> hey, I mean, yeah. I'm sure with all the fires that have been happening over the past few years, they're feeling pretty lucky that they have that thing in place. But how yeah. scary. Yeah. Jeez. See? Okay, so the hotel can be a little cheeky with things, and I don't understand why they're suddenly losing their cheekiness when it comes to the paranormal. Unfair. I think it's got to be a recent thing because, or at least in the last 20 years. So the website has a lot of stuff, and then a lot of the like more prominent stories take place in like the mid to late 90s. Okay. Should we buy this hotel and bring back, just have a resurgence of ghost stories? And by we, I mean all of us, everyone listening. If yes, you donate I was just gonna say. $3, maybe we'll make it. Actually, I'm bad at math. There's no chance we're anywhere near that. <laughs> that can be where our haunted objects go. It's our collection. Oh, okay. They each have their own room. And you know who gets to be the caretaker? That woman that you spoke to on the phone because she doesn't <laughs> believe. And so she's the most perfect person to not be scared of running yeah, this museum. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Listen, and we're not trying to be rude to her because she can believe whatever she wants. I was no, just we more... just gave her a job. Yeah. Another oh, one. You're right. <laughs> she can She can stay. She can no, stay. No, I mostly was just... I think I was just so excited and enthralled by this idea of calling and, and having them say, yes, oh my gosh, let me email you a list of hauntings. And I was just so adamantly shut down that I was like, okay. It's a hard thing to do over the phone. I feel like we get, we have a lot more luck getting answers when we're in person. Cause you know, you can kind of give them a look, like a little knowing, like, hmm. You know, you I know, know you know. Up. Let's just be real. Let's all, yeah. Let's just and maybe the stories, calls friend. are recorded. Who knows? True. Yeah, she's new. She could still be going through training. She has to say exactly what's on the script. Yeah, she was just doing her job. She was. Anyway, after the hospital closed, it became a hotel again, and because the Navy stripped so many of the things, the Hotel Colorado had to invest a lot of time and money into restoring antiques and the original design of the hotel. And according to many, except for this lady at the front desk, walking into the hotel is a very spiritual experience. From feeling as if you've stepped back in time, to breathing in the beautiful Colorado air, to feeling and seeing ghosts, the Hotel Colorado has something about it that just feels special. The Hotel Colorado has it all, including the origin story of the teddy bear. So this story, has to do with Theodore Roosevelt and his daughter, Alice. Oh. As the story goes, President Theodore Roosevelt frequented the Hotel Colorado and spent a many summer on the property with his family. So much so that the hotel was nicknamed the Little White House of the West, and even today, there is a suite dedicated to the president. During his stay in 1905, Theodore Roosevelt would go out hunting and spend weeks doing so. But apparently more often than not, he came back empty-handed, which... People at the hotel like to tease him about. It became a bit of a joke that he was not a great hunter and the chambermaids gifted Theodore a burlap, burlap bear, kind of as a mock gesture. So they had like out of burlap sack stuffed it and made it into the shape of a bear. But Theodore Roosevelt did not find it very funny, but he did. He was just more like, mm, that hurts my ego. So he gives this bear <laughs> to his daughter, Alice, who was so excited by the gift that she decided to call it Teddy, Teddy the oh, Bear. Oh, so sweet. Because her dad's name. The origin. I didn't realize Teddy Bears were after Theodore Roosevelt. Yes. So I think there are different origin stories, but this is one that the Hotel Colorado claims, and it's also one that other, you know, just depending on who you ask and where you look, this is apparently the birth of the infamous Teddy Bear name. Another frequent visitor was Molly Brown, who you covered a while back when we talked about the Molly Brown house in Colorado. Mm -hmm. So she is known for surviving the Titanic and has the nickname Unsinkable Molly Brown. She was a well-known philanthropist in Colorado as well as being the survivor of the Titanic. And she actually spent a lot of time at the hotel. So the hotel wanted to honor her in some way and they worked with Molly Brown's granddaughter, or great-granddaughter, one of the two, to build the suite, and they did extensive research with her help, and they even pulled never-before-seen photographs and one-of-a-kind personal items of Molly Brown's that are now in that suite. But, you know, that's all fascinating and cool and fun facts for trivia, but we're here for something else, Corinne. 
We're here to once and for all unveil the truth and break down that wall of which they are trying to bury those ghosts. Because the Hotel Colorado, silly as they may be, didn't realize that ghosts have no boundaries, Corinne. Walls be damned, ghosts be slipping through them, and we're coming here to tell the truth. I really appreciate that the ghosts have an opportunity to come forward and finally, like this, I feel like this is the moment for their own revolution, right? Like they get to evolve as the stories about them evolve and they get to revolt and rally together and scream, no, we are here. And here's how we're going to start presenting ourselves in your not haunted hotel. (laughs) And so exactly here they are. And the nice thing is that all of these ghosts are perfectly pleasant. So we don't know why they would want to refute them, but Anyway, here we are. The Hotel Colorado is very haunted. It's no surprise considering the history. The Wild West, infamous outlaws, bootlegging, gunslinging, Al Capone, World War II hospital, presidents. The land was sacred. It was home to the Ute tribes, and they called the land Yampa, which translates to big medicine. So they believed it had healing properties, that the waters are sacred, and if you drank from it, it would heal you. It was a very special spiritual place. So we have that as the groundwork for what is also already a haunted hotel. The basement is haunted. The lobby is haunted. The guest floors are haunted. The entire place is haunted. So we'll begin with the lobby in the main floor. You enter this beautiful hotel and people feel as if you step back in time. There's the sounds of the indoor waterfall, the crackling of a wood burning fire. It's just settling. It puts you at ease. And so it's no wonder that the hotel's founding father, Walter Devereaux, would haunt it. He is the most famous ghost at the hotel, and guests and staff call him by his name, Walter. He has been seen countless times wandering the halls, overseeing lobby operations, and he's just an observer. He doesn't really micromanage. I think he's just happy that the hotel is still operating and that it's bringing in a lot of guests. He is often accompanied by a cigar smoke, which is an unmistakable scent, you know, like when you smell cigars, you you know that smell. But there's this woman named Kathy Fleming who actually has spent, I think she's probably the one person who has recorded most of the encounters, if not all of the encounters of this hotel. She wrote a book called Apparition Manor, which is a great title. True ghost stories of Hotel Colorado. And she spent years staying at the hotel and speaking to employees and visitors and published a book in 1995. So her book is just all ghostly encounters that happened I am at the hotel. I am so glad that this exists. Yes. With the threat of losing some of these stories right now, I'm so glad that there is an entire book dedicated to what has happened over the past few decades. I agree. How, how great. Yeah. And you can't find a ton of her stories unless you buy the book, which I did not do, but I'm sure she has way more stories than I will cover on this episode. But so Kathy posited that the lobby cigar spirit is actually a man named E.E. E. Lucas, who began working at the hotel in 1893 as the hotel controller. And then he was promoted to manager in 1905, which is the same time that the teddy bear was created. And he then bought the hotel in 1916. He loved it that much. He owned it and lived in it. And I think he died in 1927 and his wife took over ownership until 1938. So Kathy posited that it could be Lucas, but it could be both, right? Like if yeah. both of these men loved the hotel, they owned it at some point, they both smoked cigars. Like I understand why those two spirits could get confused or feel like only one exists, but they both, there's room for, there's room for two because there's room for thousands. To your point, exactly. It's hard to identify spirits unless they've been captured on film or seen for prolonged (laughs) periods of time where like we can actually see their faces and compare them to old photographs of that person. Because I was going to say, there's been so many times where we've heard of hotels and just various places that people enjoyed so much that even though they were just a visitor, they still haunt that place. They still visit it in the afterlife. So yeah, it could be these two men and it probably more likely than not is one of these two men or both, but it also just could be another patron. It could be a number of spirits. I do. I laughed because you said, unless they're captured and you had like a slight pause and then you continued your sentence. And I was like, who's capturing ghosts, Corinne? Is this something you can do? You're collecting teeth. (laughs) 
I'm now capturing ghosts. <laughs> Send me all your ghost We're, hunting we boxes. We make a good team. Equipment. The Ghostbusters. Yes. The Ghostbusters. GBI. Okay, so then, so yeah, it could be either one. It could be many different spirits. What we do know is that there are more than just two spirits in this hotel. There is a woman in the main downstairs portion of the hotel. She's actually been seen in multiple places. And again, like, I think there's a lot of hypothesizing of who it could be. But back in the day when the hotel was operating as a naval hospital, there was a young nurse whose name was Bobby. Although in some of the stories, her name was Florence. The website says Bobby, so I'm just going to go with that. Mm -hmm. Bobby worked at the hospital tending to patients, and there was very little downtime, but she ended up getting swept off her feet by an officer who worked at the hospital. The two fell in love, and they spent their time together, but then Bobby was like, "Mm, I feel like I got caught up in this. I don't know that we actually are compatible, and so they broke up. But they had to continue working together, and this man, I believe, started getting jealous as Bobby became interested in another man. So it became this very complicated love triangle, and the officer became enraged with jealousy. That's so much so, very sadly, he murdered Bobby. Oh my gosh. I don't know why I didn't see that coming. I just... I know. I didn't. Oh, that's horrible. It's very sad. And a cover-up on a cover-up. Apparently, instead of this man being arrested or punished for his crimes, the Navy sent the man away and then they covered it up. But a lot of people had worked at this hospital. They had heard Bobby complaining of this man who was showing jealous tendencies. And everyone basically was like, this was cover up, a cover-up. She was murdered and they leaked the story to the public. I was not able to verify as many others who have heard the story have not been able to verify the story or the names of anyone, but the legend does live on. And so too does a spirit that many people believe is Bobby. She haunts a lot of places in the hotel. She's seen roaming hallways, but she's also often found in the dining rooms, which makes me think she likes to be around people. Mm -hmm. Guests and hotel staff have reported smelling her perfume or it was called, people think it's a gardenia perfume that was... (sighs) made only in the 30s and 40s and was discontinued. I would love that perfume. I love the smell of gardenia. Yeah. Wait, this makes me wonder if if it was discontinued in the 30s and 40s. I wonder if we went back to Pickwick's in Portsmouth, New Hampshire that has the old perfumery and it has scents that like JFK and all the Teddy Roosevelt, you know, like people, historic figures wore. I wonder if they have something that's really similar. I wonder if they would know the smell scent interesting we should ask yeah i can call them see if they call them they're more helpful they will be (laughs) they will be they were so helpful so her smell it kind of like it's so fun people will be at one table she has like her favorite dining table and her smell will be there and then all of a sudden it will like kind of drift away and but if you follow it it moves so it's like as if she's moving she moves to the buffet area and then comes back to the table so she's very much so she goes and gets a snack And then she goes back to the table. I love that for her. That is exactly how you should spend the afterlife. Just smelling good like flowers, going and And grabbing some some food. Yeah, smelling the good smells. What's in the buffet today? I don't know. I'll go look. I have eternity to figure it out. (laughs) What do I want? Everything. Employees have reported hearing the clatter of dishes and crashing in the dining room, but when they go to investigate, there's no mess, which, thank goodness. There is apparently the summer of 1992 every night they like you know they would clear the tables they put candles away they put all the silverware and everything away but at night the like hotel auditor like the people who would work at night would go into the dining room and see a candle on the table lit by itself and the candles had all been put away they were very confused they would blow out the candle they'd leave they come back it would be lit again and these candles would burn all night long in a very strange and slow way. Like these candles shouldn't have lasted all night long and then they did. So I don't know what it was about the summer of 1992, but maybe there was a romantic, ghostly courting situation going on. Oh, interesting. Oh, that's really romantic. That's really nice. (laughs) That's just my hypothesis. But I believe it. No longer, it's proved. Boom, in my head. It's proved. Fact. Proved, (laughs) proved and proven. Kathy also wrote of a story where the night auditor in the 1980s saw a figure wearing charcoal gray slacks and a red and white vest. Then apparently in 1993, a desk clerk and kitchen staff both saw the same apparition 
and it did the same thing. It would appear, they'd double, do a double take, and poof, it would be gone. A lot of the hauntings apparently occur between 2 and 4 a.m., which is great. And moving upstairs, I would caution you to be wary of the elevator. Not in the, oh, they're not safe kind of way, but in the, you're most likely riding this with a ghost kind of way. Because the elevator moves between floors by itself, on its own, without anyone in it. And this is common. Like, I think the elevators or the ghosts move around the hotel quite frequently um, they use the elevator. They also open and close doors without having a key. So people will like close their door, go down to their dining, go do their thing and come back up. And the, their room will be wide open and they'll call the front desk and be like, Hey, did someone come in our room? And there's no, no one who came. Wow. They're so active. I wonder if it's, if they leave behind the scents of like, sometimes it smells like cigars. Sometimes it smells like gardenia. Sometimes there's no scent at all. If it's just a variety of spirits or if they theorize, if they're thinking maybe it's just one exploratory ghost. Yeah. I I think it's probably multiple just because it's happened so many times that it does just seem like this hotel is as populated by the living as it is by the dead. This part reminds me a bit of Hotel Portsmouth, which used to be the Sice Inn in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, near that perfumery. And my mom had stayed there, had an experience with a spirit at night. And then a few years later, met someone who worked at the front desk in a social setting, like outside of outside of work. And she was talking about how the spirits would get off the elevator and just like go out into the street. They'd like... Mm-hmm leave the hotel too not only would they wander around the hotel but they would leave the hotel and come back yes it's just it that part i think is just so exciting it's not just like one room that the spirits can find to and you're like thing. not really sure what type of haunting it is these spirits just they live there they're going about their lives i don't know if they know they're dead or not it doesn't really matter though because they have things to do people to see it's a social club Yeah. Yeah. They're popular. Some guests have actually woken up to a woman standing over them, which primarily happens to male guests. And some people have theorized as a spirit of Bobby, the nurse who had been murdered. Again, uncertain. But room 661 is said to be the most haunted room of the hotel. And there's one prominent story that comes from a couple who stayed in the room back in 1993. And again, this is from Kathy's book. So a lot of the stories are from the 1990s. So the man was feeling a bit under the weather. And so his wife opened the windows to give him some fresh air and she left and was like, you get some rest, you sleep, I'll come back. The man was kind of in a, you know, a half sleep phase when he heard his door open and he heard what he thought was his wife's voice saying, I'm going to close the windows. I don't want the draft to make you more ill. So she closes the windows and then leaves. But then shortly thereafter, she returns and changes her mind and opens the windows. She left and then came back and decided to close them. This happened multiple times over a three-day period until the man finally asked why his wife kept changing her mind, to which she said, what? I'm not. I'm continuously frustrated that you keep closing the windows every time I leave. Oh, my God. And he's like, what? That, what is happening? So basically, there's a ghost who disagreed with the woman's decision to have the windows open and she was like no 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 the draft will make it worse i love that that woman didn't confront her husband either she was just like i'll just keep fixing it and we're not staying here for forever so i'll just get through this vacation (laughs) yeah just keep opening the window he's closing the window oh it's hilarious i just loved it yeah another commonly experienced haunting is the origin is pretty sad and i feel like also common in a lot of hotels there's a haunting of a little girl playing with her ball Mm. And it is said that she tragically fell off of one of the balconies while chasing her ball and died. Many guests fought a young girl in a Victorian dress, and they believe it's this girl. It's often very startling, and so, you know, guests, if they see her, will call the front desk, but then moments later, the girl is gone. Some guests have reported that their own kids will mention their new friend, the girl in her ball, because she likes to play catch. Wow. And then, oh, this story is so heartwarming. It's about the little girl. But in 1987, there was an elderly lady who was staying at the hotel and she woke up and was startled to find a young girl in her bedroom. So she calls the front desk and asked if they had given her key to a young girl. The staff, obviously very perplexed, was like, uh, no. 
The woman was curious because there was a girl just still standing at the foot of her bed. So she was like, I'm, I'm certain I'm seeing a ghost. And so the woman decided to be Come friends with the ghost. They became such good friends that for years, every year thereafter, this woman would return to the hotel always requesting the same room so that she could, in quotes, visit an old friend. I just got full body chills. I've never felt so happy for the ghost of a little girl. She basically got her a grandma. This is yeah. so nice. And she gets the, yeah. the like trip to trips to grandma's house except it's grandma coming to visit her that's mm -hmm. so sweet i wonder what they would talk about if they would speak at know. all or if it, if it was more just like a comfortable feeling in each other's presence and that yeah i don't know older woman just realized i should probably keep coming back and providing this safe energy for this little girl when i can whatever mm. it is it, it's very pure and i love it yeah oh another story that i love is kind of again similar to something we hear with a lot of ghost stories regarding remodeling so during some remodeling there were workers who were experiencing some strange things especially in one room on the fifth floor so they applied wallpaper up on the wall it was a wallpaper picked out by the, uh, presumably the owners or the manager of the hotel at the time and when they returned to the next day the wallpaper had been torn from the walls, but very nicely. It wasn't like destroyed. It was pulled off and re-rolled up and put on the floor. They're like, that's weird. So they reapply the wallpaper with glue and come back the next day. Same thing. They do it one more time, come back the next day. Same thing. It's also extremely difficult to get wallpaper off the wall exactly. that's been glued and nicely and neatly wrap it back up. You would think that that thing would be torn to shreds. Exactly. So they're like super frustrated. And I don't know who came up with this idea, but they were like, you know what? What if we give the spirit some options? So they one night leave three different wallpaper rolls, patterns, and options rolled up on the bed and they leave for the evening. The next morning when they return, the wall was wallpapered with one of the three options and the other two were left on the bed. You're kidding me. <laughs> what? How does that happen? <laughs> How do I let that happen to my future right? home where all the home Decorate projects for are me. done for I know. me? Whoa. Isn't that cool? Oh my God. I've never wanted to see footage of something more than I want to see this. You just get like flashes of someone like in their overalls and like an old stained t-shirt, like their home improvement outfit, just putting it up. Like the spectral image of them doing it. Hard it's work. so cool. Yeah, I love it. And then just the last couple stories come from the basement, which of course is haunted because it's the basement. Doors will open and close on their own. It also, the basement once served as the rum running headquarters. It also served as a morgue and naval prison and storage. So it's dark, damp, and definitely haunted. In 1993, a houseman named Dave was doing rounds in the basement when he saw what was like what looked like an old woman peering in the basement window from outside. And mm. he was super concerned because in order to look through the window, you would have needed like a pretty high ladder. Yeah. And so he was worried that maybe she fell, that she was hurt. And so he turns the light on and turns back to the window, but poof, she's gone. Oh. During a nighttime tour, which the lady at the front desk assured me no longer happens, a security guard named Richard was leading a group of six people through the basement and you know telling them about the history of it and they hear they pause because they hear two women talking and they hear the sounds of a typewriter like being written on and richard's like oh maybe some of the housekeeping staff is still here like i'll show you into their quarters he knocks on the door and opens it to make the introduction when upon opening the door no one is there the room is empty the lights are off there are no women there is no typewriter but they heard it, all of them, all seven of them heard it clear as day, women talking and a typewriter typing. So I don't know. You tell me, is the Hotel it Colorado was us haunted? in our past life, <laughs> scheming and writing ghost stories in a hotel. <laughs> is this all some big cover up conspiracy? Is the government involved? I don't know. <laughs> it might be. That is why GBI is here to reveal the truth. And also, let me just say, keep in mind, so many of these stories came from the Hotel Colorado website and blog itself. Wow. It's haunted. I'm very curious about that last experience with the women 
talking and using the typewriter because I just wonder if there were any long-term residents, like any writers or or poets or people who stayed at that hotel. Because you said there were so many prominent people when it first opened. And I can't imagine that most people would just travel to a hotel with their typewriter. That seems very cumbersome and not something that most people could even afford. And so I'm just curious who these women were, what they were doing, and just the fact that they were writing in a hotel room also makes me, I think my mind is just, maybe they were just working, right? And that was just part of their job. But also part of me is like, what if they were uncovering something? Like they were working within the secrecy of this hotel room and there was something big that came out and we just don't know that this is where they... I have influenced your thoughts right now. I think you have. You really have. This is a podcast where just a a classic ghost story can very quickly turn into a whole conspiracy. (laughs) A government cover-up, of course. A government cover-up. You hear that, Mom? (laughs) Conspiracies! (laughs) Conspiracies! I feel like we should be two girls, one ghost, and many conspiracies. And many conspiracies. I'm just so shocked at how many spirits are here because we, we've we done so much research on so many haunted places. And I feel like hotels are are classically the place where there'll be like two or three spirits that we, we hear the most about. But this one has so many different spirits, so many different witnesses so, in, over prolonged periods of time. It's not just like, oh, five times in room three, a couple of people felt they're... they're feet being tickled at night, you know, there's so much. I do much. feel like hotels, I don't know. I, I feel like most hotels, at least that we cover on this podcast, because we try to find ones with a lot of stories, do have a lot of hauntings. And even ones that are not like n- notably known, because think about how much energy is passing through a hotel, especially one this big. Like There are a lot of guest rooms here. There's a lot of, I just think about, you know, growing up when I went on family vacation there was a lot of like family drama. There was a lot of like heartbreak and stuff that was going on that would probably leave a stain behind. So it's not even active hauntings, but like residual energy left behind and people traveling for funerals or something happening like tragically on a trip and people dying in hotels. Like I just think hotels have so many secrets in the walls. You're right. And two, now that I'm thinking about it, there are just so many, so, so many stories from each place that we'll never hear. Like if we use our podcast, for example, if we search Stanley Hotel in our inbox, we have a hundred emails about people's experiences at the Stanley Hotel. How many experiences do the people at the Stanley Hotel, how many of those, yeah, have been told, like they haven't been chronicled in one central location. So maybe we need to create a database now. The GBI database. Yeah. Kind of like missing 411, but just all the odd Missing ghost stories. Missing ghost stories. Have you stayed at this hotel? Have you walked through this cemetery? Have you seen this ghost? Have you seen Wanted? (laughs) Your story about (laughs) smelling gardenia perfume. Yes. Wow. But that's Hotel Colorado, which I am down to go to. And I'm down to go to this place too. Yeah. I need to get some evidence for us, for ourselves. And I am going to meet this woman at the front desk in person and say, hello, you spoke to me on the phone and I am here to convince you of the ghosts. Come with me. Yeah. Just say, I just don't Hop believe you. on you. the you ghost ride. Convincing. I know there are ghosts here. There are whole books written are. about the spirits yes. here. They're here. We're here. Let's go. When I was at Nikita's wedding in Mexico at the welcome party on Friday night, which was so fun. We learned all of these traditional Indian dances and I was having a blast. But someone's fiance was there and said that he didn't believe in spirits. Basically, I was like intro to him and then we were all around this one cocktail table. And basically the conversation went like, oh, what do you do for work? Blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, Karen has a Ghost podcast, Curran, come in, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, Mia, you know Mia from college, right? Okay, yeah. So Mia was there, and the whole time me and this guy are trying to have like a, a regular conversation about him saying like, oh, I don't really believe in ghosts. I don't believe in any of that stuff. And me being like, 
I totally get that. Like you have to experience things for yourself, blah dee da. If I told you how many emails we had, skeptics turned believers, maybe you'd be open to understanding that perhaps you're a target for the paranormal. Anyway, we're having this conversation. It's very, it's very, what's the word I'm looking for? It's civil. There's nothing fiery about it. But Mia at the other side of this tiny little cocktail table the whole time for like five minutes that's going, get him, Corinne, fuck him up. Tell him the ghosts are real, convince him, get a Corinne. Like it was like she was watching this battle that wasn't happening. And she was like, go, go, you got this. <laughs> It's like, you're like wrestling about ghost stories, even though that's not like, yeah, <laughs> not a real like, fight. Yeah! <laughs> I was like, Mia is the best hype person ever. We need to keep her in our pocket and bring her out whenever someone actually is kind of aggressive towards us saying like, ghosts aren't real. I'm like, that's when I need the energy that Mia was bringing that night when I was having this conversation with this other guy. Have her on speed dial, like phone a friend. Mia, phone a friend. we're going to put you on in the background. <laughs> she, oh, she was like front row at a sporting event. It was so funny. I love that so much. I don't think I convinced him, but I think he is open now to the possibility yeah, you know, of spirits. Open to being convinced. Open to being convinced. Okay. I have a ghost story sent in from a listener. And surprisingly, now hearing how many spirits are at this hotel, Sabrina, Mm -hmm. we don't have any emails, at least that I could find in the search terms I was using, from this hotel. But I did find an email that was sent in from someone who's following up back when we had Campfire Stories on Spotify Live. Now it's on Patreon in case anyone's wondering where it is. But they sent a follow-up and basically provided even more ghost stories and they're all from Colorado. So I was like, oh, this is perfect. So even though we're not at the hotel, perfect. we're within the vicinity, we're within the state, and there's definitely multiple spirits involved. I love it. Okay. This is the follow-up from the story, The Ghost Who Ages With Me, in case anyone was wondering. Okay, lovely ghostesses. So I'm writing right after getting off of Campfire Stories and telling you guys about the ghost girl who ages with me. I figured it wouldn't hurt to send an email with a little more context and stories about what happened when I tried to look into who she might be. (sighs) Essentially, I saw her those first couple of times that I told you about, the one as a child and the one in high school. Then after the one in high school, my friend and I decided to go and try and figure out who she was. And I remember we were theorizing like, is this some other version of her, like a traveling soul that didn't get to live this life with her? We just didn't really know. And I don't know if we will know, but we might at the end of this. Yeah. Then after one in high school, my friend and I decided to try to figure out who she was. This friend lived right across from the hotel that I spoke of in an old general store of this mining town. She was only there sometimes because she split custody between her mom and her dad, so I'd usually only see her in the summer. She actually saw the girl in the blue dress with me the time that I saw her in the mine opening. After that, we went to the town library and just generally started asking around and did some teenage spiritual witchy stuff to see if we could figure out things that way too. That's when the hat man started coming around. Hmm. The first time I saw him actually was with this little girl in that mine opening. Not sure why I didn't bring that one up on Kimber Stories. <laughs> yeah, what? Uh, I guess I was just overwhelmed a little. He stood behind her. I saw him the second time with my friend when we were sitting upstairs in the general store. I love how she's just calling it the general store instead of this person's house. Because it used to be a general <laughs> store. Yeah, yeah. There was a stairwell from the outside that came up onto the porch. We heard someone coming up the stairs and this honestly wouldn't be super weird because there are a lot of people that come in and out and often her dad would just come up that way anyway. It wasn't weird, that is, until we saw a silhouette of a person outside of the windows. He was wearing the bowler hat and by this time we were familiar with what that meant and realized that we were seeing the hat man. At this point though, I think he was still just trying to warn us because after some teenage girls screaming, he simply disappeared. The next time that I had any type of experience involving these spirits happened in the same general store and I was hanging out with this friend, her boyfriend, and my boyfriend at the time. We were just sitting around, probably smoking weed, lol, when my boyfriend looked at the three of us and got a very strange look on his face. He honestly had a flair for the dramatic and I was pretty sure he was just fucking around. But he started acting like he was possessed. He couldn't quite get words out for a minute, kind of just nervously stuttering until he finally turned and pointed down this old dark hallway that was basically a storage room and said, 
he's coming. (gasps) Then kind of passed out and woke back up as himself. Again, thinking he honestly was just being dramatic or trying to fuck with us, I decided to play the brave one. While everyone was freaking out, I said, I'll go down this hallway and see what was there. And like I said, it was just kind of this storage space, maybe more of just a long rectangular room than a hallway, if that makes sense, but with low slanted ceilings on one side. So I went down this hallway, climbing over boxes and junk along the way until I got to the end where it kind of was opened up to more of this real room. And I looked around and yelled back to my friends that there was nothing here. After saying that, I turned to take one more look into the room when the entire room changed. Sabrina, on Campfire Stories, you brought up these things possibly being a time slip. Well, here's what happened to me. Suddenly, Mm. the room looked brand new. Not that it was modern, but that it wasn't in a state of disrepair that it was in the current modern timeline. In the center of the room, there was a silver operating table with instruments sitting on it, and a man in a hat was standing there with his back turned to me, an instrument in his hand. (gasps) Trust me, I did not want to see what happened if he turned around. So I looked back into the main room, and by that time, I looked back into the hallway, and again, it was just a pile of junk. What the heck? I know this is getting lengthy, that's why I couldn't explain all of this in Campfire Stories, but this is the one that made me stop trying to figure out who this little girl in the blue dress was. Shortly after some of those experiences, my friend went back home to her mom's, so it was just me. Still feeling a little brave, I had been making a couple attempts at trying to figure out who this girl was, and at this point, I was also trying to figure out who the man in the hat could be. Maybe that's where I made the real mistake. School had started back up for the fall, and I remember being in my childhood bedroom. For a little bit of context, my bed shared a wall with the stairwell, and it faced out towards a big bay window. My stairway was super creaking, and I would always hear my mom come up and wake me up in the morning. Now, if it was up to just alarms, I never would have gone to school. So one night, I was laying in bed asleep, and I heard footsteps in my stairwell. My natural reaction was thinking that my mom was coming up, but I kind of heard these footsteps stop halfway up. This made me wake up a little bit. I looked out the big bay window to see it was still very obviously moonlight shining in, and that is when I realized it definitely wasn't time to get up for school. So I propped myself up in the bed, also noting that my feet weren't covered. This was only particularly weird because at the time we had a kitten who also loved to attack your toes at night, so I always (laughs) had my feet tucked in very well. Mm -hmm. I heard the footsteps coming further up my stairs and propped myself up on the bed with the moonlight shining in the window. I saw a hand wrap around the corner of the wall into my bedroom like something out of a horror movie. And then it just kind of glitches. And suddenly, the hat man is standing fully in my room. No! He glitches again, and he was fully at the foot of my bed. I remember being propped up, wide-eyed, staring at him. He doesn't have any features. He's just darkness. What the heck? That's when he grabbed my uncovered ankles. (gasps) The feeling of him touching me was so cold. It's kind of indescribable. And he pulled me down in bed with such force that I went about a foot. I fully remember from being propped up on my elbows to now being flat on my back. And then he was just gone. This was an instance where I was certain that if I kept looking into who either of these things were, this would continue. I had never had an entity be able to exert so much physical force on me, and luckily haven't since. Much love, Delina and Ryu the Lucky Black Cat. See you on the other side. Holy cow on the ice. Holy cow on the ice. Whew. This is a lot that was left out when we originally were told parts of the story on Campfire Stories. So I was like, okay, knowing that this is in the Colorado area, I got to read this again. It almost feels like this hat man type thing is like the collector of the spirit that follows her. Because the way that when she went into that storage room and it transformed into a different time period almost, like, and he's standing with the surgical instruments, like, it makes me think that either he was a doctor of some kind, almost like like a mad scientist doctor, or I don't know, I'm thinking of like Ghost Whisperer and Medium and just like these spirits that uh, collected yeah. other spirits 
and it's almost like keeping them theirs and in line and almost this little girl is trying to get answers but can't get away from this man it's just so weird too that they were hanging out and first seen at least the friend at the mouth basically like the entrance of the mine like the mining shaft which is just so freaky because i i feel like i just think more of actual ghosts and spirits and these like odd pairings of spirits being in houses or being in cemeteries and not in a place that feels so out of place for how they're presenting themselves like they're not appearing to be minors right like they're it's a little girl in a victor in a victorian like blue dress or whatever and this surgical hat man being demon doctor guy <laughs> Because it almost feels like it's unrelated to the land and more related to, to her, our listener, and her life than anything. Yeah. It is odd because, yeah, it's the the girl, little girl spirit ages with her. With her. But I don't know. I think it was just like the amount of times that they saw this guy in this area, in this town, around the mining shaft, in the old general store. To me, it felt like he was there, especially because when they were down in the basement area, they saw him with the surgical knife. And I don't know if he's an actual spirit or a demon or, or, or maybe like a m demonic manifestation chipped off from someone who was once a human. But it did make me think that like he did have some ties to that land, to that town. And maybe he was the town doctor. Maybe he was the one doing these surgical I procedures don't know. I on guess people. we never will know. And then he dumped their bodies creepy. down the mine to hide them because he was a murderer. Corinne. I don't know. It's scary. No, either way. Another cover up. But yeah, another. Oh my gosh. Here we are. <laughs> GBI taking Colorado. the covers off all these cover ups. Colorado, Colorado we we're see coming you. for you. We, we know, know what you're, you're trying doing. to hide from us. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. No. Anyway, thank you for listening, everyone. If you have ghost stories, if you have theories of uh, ghost, like of what we read, please email those to us because we're always curious to hear other perspectives and also everyone's paranormal encounters. And also comment your theories on on Instagram because we we uh, publish posts for every single episode, so we can get a conversation going, so we can all know what. We're all excited hear your to theories hear. together. You can email us at two girls ghost podcast at gmail.com. You can rate and review us on iTunes. Rate and review all your favorite shows. It goes a long way and does it does a lot of good. So make sure you do that. And then you can join us on Patreon. We have some exciting news that will be launched on Patreon first. So I don't know. Join us there. Join us on Campfire Stories every Tuesday if you're a Patreon donor. What else do we have, Corinne? The triangles, the pyramid scheme, get lost. Let's do it. Hi. Hey, bye. That's Thank it. you for your support. Many ways to support us. Check out our website, Two Girls, One Ghost, for basically a list of all of them. And also thank you to Christina, who edits our podcast, edits yes. the video on YouTube. So go subscribe on YouTube if you want to yes. see our faces. Edits the ad-free versions that are available on Patreon and also the versions that are available for anyone to listen to, which is probably what some of you are listening to right now. So thank you, Christina. Mm -hmm. And we will see you. See you. On the other side.